Andy Warhol once said, They always say time changes things, but you actually have to change them yourself. While I doubt he was talking of pre-hospital spinal care, it is a quote which resonates in the adoption of a long-time practice of spinal mobilization. Spinal mobilization has been a mainstay of treatment in the pre-hospital environment for a long time. While there was a mounting amount of evidence that spinal mobilization was more detrimental to the patient and should only be used in specific situations, it really wasn't until the National Registry of Emergency Medical Technicians announced the utilization of the 2018 Joint Position Statement from the National Association of EMS Physicians and the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma as a guideline for their testing process did we begin to see a much wider acceptance by pre-hospital providers of a move to an evidence-based approach to what is now referred to as spinal, spinal motion restriction, otherwise known as SMR. This position statement by two superpower trauma groups who each have their hand in pre-hospital trauma education is also endorsed by several organizations. As a result, it is imperative that our current students and EMS providers are aware of this consensus document. Now, you can go find this document at the American College of Surgeons website or the National Association of EMS Physicians website. So let's start at an easy location. First off, there is no role for spinal motion restriction and penetrating trauma. It does not apply. So therefore, it makes our job a little bit easier today. So we're going to pull from the, this consensus document the idea of using this information for blunt trauma. Blunt trauma is a mechanism of injury that typically results from falls or motor vehicle crashes, etc., those types of things. So during your assessment of the patient, if you identify any of these following areas, spinal motion restriction is indicated. Things such as altered mental status, and that is anybody who has an altered mental status with a GCS of less than 15 for any reason. If there's any signs of intoxication or they have any neck or back pain that they complain of, or you identify tenderness when you are palpating that midline area and during your visual or um, physical inspection, if you notice that there's some type of spinal deformity, maybe there is some numbness or weakness in the extremities. And finally, if you identify that there is a distracting injury, such as long bone fractures, crush injuries, maybe burns and communication barriers, just to name a few. If any of these are identified, you must apply an appropriately sized cervical collar. Be sure that you follow the manufacturer's recommendations regarding the sizing. Now, once a cervical collar is applied, the remainder of the spine needs to remain in alignment. Now, this may be accomplished by using a backboard, a scoop stretcher, a vacuum mattress, or even using an ambulance stretcher. Now, typically, the backboard, the scoop, or the vacuum mattress are going to be used as a transfer device to the ambulance stretcher. It then becomes imperative that the provider assess and weigh the risk versus benefit of removing the patient from one of these transfer devices and allow them to remain comfortable on the stretcher. The stretcher should remain in a flat position, and at any time that the patient may need to be elevated, it is imperative that the device itself have the head elevated, because spinal motion restriction cannot be properly performed with a patient in a sitting position. We hope that you found this information helpful. 
If you have any comments on this topic or have an idea for future topics, please leave a comment below and be sure to like or follow our social media pages. Take care.